this is uh, for the supercell that we're tracking right here. There you can see it. Uh, Monty is uh, zooming in on the radar here. It's going to be heading towards the Blue Lick area. For many across southern Indiana and northern Kentucky, when you mention March 2nd, 2012, you get memories like this. Pretty much at least portion of the town destroyed by a tornado is taking a second hit. As we've mentioned, this is a tornado emergency now being declared for Carol. It was a day of violent weather and devastation and will not be forgotten by the people of Southern Indiana, Central Kentucky, and all across the Ohio Valley, as well as for the meteorologist here at the National Weather Service office in Louisville, Kentucky, who worked and lived through that day. Is that one thing at the weather service is we're really busy before the event. We had an event on February 29th. We had seven or eight tornadoes. We were busy with that event. We're preparing for the next event. And we go to a high risk. So we, that day we had ever all hands on deck. If you had a pulse, you were out here working, answering phones or doing whatever. Yeah, we could see that this was going to be a monster outbreak. Uh, all the parameters were there, even a couple of days ahead. And we actually had some severe weather. It's either one or two days before it. Uh, and we knew that wasn't the big one. We knew the next one, the next one coming up, that was going to be the big day. So we had, we were fully staffed. We brought in everybody. Um, so, and I told Rosie, who's a school teacher up in Pekin, uh, that this was going to be a bad day. Uh, and I told all my friends uh, that lived around there, this was going to be a bad day. You know, we didn't know exactly what part of the state was going to get hit with a tornado, um, but we knew somewhere in southern Indiana or northern Kentucky it was going to be a bad day. This was a fairly significant event from looking at the meteorological um, aspects of it. Um, certainly one of the strongest events, if not the strongest event that I've seen in my time here. And I was one of the warning forecasters that afternoon for the initial convection that was developing over southern southwest Indiana. And we were ready to go. The atmosphere was primed that day for a severe weather outbreak. The Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, had central Kentucky and southern Indiana under a high-risk outlook. That meant widespread severe storms were expected, and they would likely be long-lived, dangerous, and intense. Early afternoon, the severe weather began to move into the Louisville forecast area, and there was very little doubt in the mind of the forecasters what these storms were capable of. Like I said, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at a radar, you know, it's hard to tell these were no-brainers. I mean, you know, anybody who had any type of radar training would have known that these were awful, horrible storms. So when we started seeing the signatures on the radar, it wasn't surprising in any way. It was almost the same as what we would see in, in our simulations from the planes. Um, these were supercells. And you know, capable of producing significant tornadoes given the, given the atmospheric setup at the time of instability and shear that you normally don't see in early March. But it was one phone call that afternoon that made a huge difference. Believe it or not, even though we're getting these wonderful radar signatures and everybody and their brother can see this thing, no one is reporting it to us. And you know how it is staring at a radar that you think, Oh my goodness gracious, that's got to be a tornado, but you want to have that ground truth. We didn't really know what we were dealing with. So Rosie calls and she says, Mike, I can see the tornado and there are little tornadoes inside of a big one. Well, once I reported that to Mark, he said, okay, that means that we're dealing with a multi-vortex tornado, which is always the worst ones. And he said, I'm issuing a tornado emergency for Henryville, the next town downstream of Pekin. Well, the thing was, is that there was, two, we had two supercells um, that were pretty much along the same path. They were, one was in front of the other and they were heading for um, population centers. And when Rosie Callahan, the wife of our hydrologist Mike Callahan called in from New Pekin. Uh, she saw the tornado go by and she called Mike and said it's a multiple vortex tornado. And at that time, comparing what we just heard from her and what we were seeing on the radar, we really knew that we were dealing with a significant 
um, tornado. And as it headed for the I-65 corridor, um, we decided to go ahead and issue a tornado emergency. Now, tornado emergencies are a little bit more common today than they were back in 2012 because we didn't even have a template to do that. You had to type that up manually. And so I frantically did that um, about 10 to 15 minutes before it went into Henryville and then continued doing manually typing up those tornado emergency statements as it went through Henryville and then um, through northern Clark County into um, Scott, Washing, uh, Scott and Jefferson and into Trimble. While our meteorologists were busy issuing warnings to protect life and property of those across southern Indiana and central Kentucky, the severe weather started to hit a little too close to home. As those storms were crossing the Ohio River, the nightmare scenario happened, at least for me, um, was that what would happen if I was in the office working a severe weather event and I had a cell that was heading toward my house. And back off to the southwest um, toward uh, uh, Hardensburg and Breckenridge County, there was another supercell that was going up and it also had rotational signatures and it was heading for Brandenburg where I lived at the time. And my wife and two children were on their way home from school and they got home and I was able to give them a call and say, you need to head to this basement in the safe room. This is a storm that's headed this way. I can't talk, I've got other stuff on the radar, and that was it. That's all I could, had time to talk to my wife about, and I hoped for the best. Uh, the storm did go through Brandenburg, fortunately it didn't produce a tornado, but it did produce quite a bit of large hail that damaged our house. It also damaged my parents' house that lived just a couple of miles away on the other side of um, Doe Valley Lake. And um, it wasn't until um, some time after the storm had went through before I was able to get back a hold of my wife to find out, were they okay? Was the house okay? Um, but those are kinds of distractions that, you know, you worry about as a forecaster if you're dealing with severe weather at the office and there's something headed either toward the office or headed toward family members or, or your immediate family, um, try not to get distracted with that. That was the, probably the largest, the biggest thing that bothered me during that event. Well, even though I was assigned to the Kentucky storms, I was frantically texting my wife, keeping her updated. I knew I couldn't really stop and call her, but I knew I could just get a quick text out. Uh, now, of course, we were issuing warnings well ahead, uh, but I could see that that one supercell was headed right for Pekin where she was. Um, but then, as the storm got closer, I could tell that it was probably going to go south of her. Um, and I started worrying a little less. Uh, but then I kept telling her, you know. Uh, but then there was another second sale. Um, <clears throat> and so I said, well, after this first one goes through, it was starting to show signatures as well. Uh, so I was frantically telling her, you know, like, uh, you know, stay undercover, stay undercover. Sometimes you will hear the March 2nd event be referred to as the Henryville tornado. And while these storms were devastating across southern Indiana, these storms had massive impacts across central and eastern Kentucky. Instead, across Kentucky in the Louisville service area, it was mostly damaging winds and very large hail. But once the storms moved east and out of our forecast area into the Jackson forecast area, those storms crossed over the warm front that was located over there and instantly went tornadic again and was producing EF3, EF4 storms from you know East Bernstadt down in um, uh, Southeast Kentucky and then over into um, Mount Sterling and West Liberty, um, which were probably the first EF4s in Eastern Kentucky that, that I'm aware of. We had a warm front across the area and all the tornadoes formed on the warm front or north, right on that boundary. Those are the ones that went. That's the ones that went to West Liberty and Siresville, Henryville. Uh, the ones south of there produced enormous hail. Some of the biggest hail in the history of Kentucky. Uh, we were told that Columbia 
uh, Kentucky was destroyed. This Walmart was destroyed. So we went down there and it was shelled by hail. I don't know if it was softball or grapefruit hail. It was big hail down there. For the National Weather Service, March 2nd didn't end when the storms left the area. The job then turns to going out and surveying the damage, seeing what was left behind, and hearing the stories from those impacted. After a big event comes, you need folks to try to figure out where's the damage, where are the crews going to go. We have an extra position we have in here that takes all the survey crews. We had four crews out for days and days, and it's hard to keep track of. I remember that one house in Chelsea. That's the one of the strongest damage I have ever seen. It was a well-built house, very well-built house. And somehow the tornado got under the foundation enough of the suction vortices and picked the thing up and it slid it 26 yards and turned it about 60 degrees, an entire house. And the sides of that house were looked like it had been attacked by machine gunners. And uh, they survived, but I, I, they went through living hell. Well, the, that one spot that had the possible EF5 damage, the guy had a, he had a pickup truck and he had a backhoe in a garage. And the pickup truck, he never, uh, I talked to him like a week later, he never did find it. Okay. It was just gone. Uh, the backhoe ended up in his house in his basement. Now, if you can imagine a backhoe being blown <laughs> from a garage into the guy's basement, and the garage and the, the house were pretty far apart, uh, say, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 feet, something like that. With a historic event like March 2nd, the National Weather Service uses this as an opportunity to see what worked and what we can do better. Um, really, it didn't change much in the way of our operations other than um, we've gotten better at rec pattern recognition as far as severe weather and also better at briefing our partners um, from emergency management to media um, and giving them more specific information than, than we could you know, 10 years ago. Well, I mean, we had great lead times up in Southern Indiana. I mean, that was really well, it was well forecast. Uh, we did a conference call. We had the most we've ever had on the call, 300 people, I think at the time. Uh, our surveys were amazing. The GIS surveys were on the Weather Channel. They were on CNN. Uh, what do we not do well? We overissued south of the boundary, uh, south of the warm front. Um, they were, uh, they all looked like the hook echo. They all looked good on velocity. But the uh, one thing we look at is called the LCL, the lifted condensation level, they were too high. Uh, it was too high south of the boundary. So people were getting funnels, funnel clouds, but they didn't touch down. So we really learned from that event. Uh, one thing we really evolved in is the role of the mesoanalyst. So we really changed our model here to get a role, a person that looks nothing at the high resolution data, satellite, the Kentucky Mesonet, all types of data sets to try to issue or not to issue, that is the question, and really look at the data. And that event really quantified that from this point forward. Ultimately, an event like March 2nd leaves a lasting mark. In my office, I have the, all the newspapers from that day and all the people who were killed or injured. I think about that lady who held down her kids and she is parrot, she lost her legs. I think about the devastation in Henryville and Chelsea and all across Southern Indiana massive damage. It's just unbelievable. If you don't get hit, you think, well, what's the big deal? But if you get hit, I'm telling you, it's life altering. Um, I've always said around here that forecasters uh, typically think of what is there going to be their um, largest event that they go through. The previous generation of forecasters always talked about their 1974 event, and we're talking about the super outbreak that produced EF4s and EF5s. Um, in Brandenburg and Louisville as being their event um, of their career. And I would say that March 2nd, 2012, so far has been the worst severe weather event that I've ever experienced as a weather service employee. I'd seen uh, the tornado throw cars into the school at in Henryville. I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, and in a, that poor guy that died in Henryville, I couldn't even recognize that there had been a trailer there. Uh, you know, it saw some really amazing sights I'd never seen before and, and really don't want to see yeah. again. The mission of protecting life and property is a team effort, and we cannot serve our mission without the help 
of all of our partners. You know, I appreciate, first off, we thank for those who were called in reports. Uh, one of our staff, former staff, his wife, Rosie Callahan, called in the report. We needed a report, bad. So those who do spotters and Kokoros and co-op, we thank you for your reports. Uh, I wanna thank my staff who busted their buns. People working so many hours. You know, the other thing is we really appreciate all of our partners in emergency management and in media the Corps of Engineers who worked with us on this event. This event profoundly affected the state of Kentucky and Southern Indiana and will always be remembered. It was a violent event. You know, some of these people get all excited on TV channels about storm chasing. When you have to see what we see, it is not fun and games. 